Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends. And here today I have with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh, you guys. We are going to have a super fun stream today. Before we get started, though, I do have to tell you in case you did not see my Twitter post or my Discord post, we are going to just do the storm, the Snowpiercer analysis today. No Sims 2 afterwards. Um, we can talk about it towards the end of this because I know people watch on the YouTube VOD like they don't care. <laughs> but yeah, so that you know. So welcome in, Lunar. Thank you for the first. Yes, I Hi, love SiriBot. I think you should get SiriBot. It's 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 really cool and not very invasive. So yeah. But yeah, we're gonna talk about Snowpiercer today, right, Landon? We are. I'm very excited about it. Okay. So wait, before we talk about it, oh my God. <gasps> Lunar, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sub to Avatar, Izzy. Thank you, Bay. Thank you so much. While I get a pin for you, we're going to do something fun. Um, this isn't, you know what? This is so favorite that I it can't even fit into the favorite things. We have to do it first. Okay. We are all going to listen to the song, the beautiful, lovely song. I'm sorry, YouTube. I'm not going to put it on, on YouTube. We'll skip. We'll just edit this part out for the, for the VOD. Okay, you guys. All right. So let's get started for real. Um, Landon, is there anything you want to say before we switch over to the presentation? I don't think so. Uh, okay. Other than I, we didn't put it in the slideshow, uh, but I just wanted to give a warning of if you haven't seen Snowpiercer, A, we do, we do spoilers. And B, also there are some adult and graphic themes in this that we are going to talk about. So like, yes. just be, just be prepared that if you eek or ick or ish easily, that perhaps this is not the show for you today. True. True, true, true. Okay, let's let's let everybody see. All right, Snowpiercer. What? So a warning what? for the future. So um, last uh, podcast episode, we talked about um, a romance. Um, and and that is kind of like, as our little, these are our little prelude episodes to Hunger Games starting next mm -hmm. month, right? Um, but what Hunger Games is really about is um, a dystopia speaking about um, America specifically. Snowpiercer is um, an international dystopia. So yes. it's kind of a little prelude to talking about an American one. Um, we wanted to talk about uh, an, an international one. And Landon and I, and I both love Snowpiercer. This is not a conversion episode. This is not like a Landon showed me something or I showed Landon something. We both think this movie is like excellent, top yeah. tier, amazing. Even, even if you get spoiled today with us, you should still go watch it. It will still be good because this is a very rewatchable movie. It is incredibly rewatchable. And I also want to say it's like one of those movies that you get something new every time you rewatch it. And also it's a... It's a movie that I feel like is best for everybody. Yeah. Uh, because it's an action movie, but also there's an incredible acting and really good drama and some cool intrigue. And it's it, it definitely falls into the sci-fi action category, but there is something for everybody. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I would say that everything in this movie is like top tier A plus. I think honestly, if like we were going to do an interstage window rewrite, the only thing I would do is um, hire someone better for the musical score. The musical score is a yeah. little underwhelming, um, but everything else is like five star A plus like amazing top tier. No notes. Every, I mean, Perfect. Yeah, we're going to we're going to fan. I We've had several uh we've had several shows in the past where it has been like a this is what's wrong with everything in this. That's not what's gonna be the this no. what what this <laughs> is going to be. This is going to be a everything about this movie is perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really truly really is. And welcome in, Ninja. Hello. Do you like science Hello. fiction? I hope you do, because it's science it's we're talking about some sci science fiction today. So yeah, I mean, Snowpiercer. So here's here's the deal with that label though. Like it is sci-fi, but it's not it's like it's like beginner sci-fi. Oh, because yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like the technology that exists is not that far off from the technology yeah. that exists in our definitely. real life. It's definitely so it doesn't a it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like Star Warsy or it doesn't feel which is actually more fantasy, but it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like out there sci fi. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. this is very realistic sci fi. Yeah. This is not three body problem where you have to actually think or anything like no. that. It's very realistic, easy to understand, very near future, much like Hunger Games. <laughs> much like Hunger Games. Yes. 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 So, All yeah. right. Well, this is Enter Stage Window presents Snowpiercer, a warning for the future. <laughs> so, like we begin every single stream, let's talk about some favorite 
things. Karen, what was your favorite thing? Oh my gosh. This movie. Just choose one. You can only choose one. It's so hard, you guys, but this is what I chose for my favorite thing this week. And it is Minister Mason, Tilda Swinton, like one of her best performances ever. Love her. Absolute goddess. Um, But in this in particular, she is so compelling. She plays um, in this. I mean, you guys that have been watching for a while, you know the type of villain I love. She plays exactly the type of villain that I love. She is, you know, girl boss, straight up evil, there to support um, the the proto-fascist dictator. I mean, I just love, I just love everything about this character. And I love the like gravitas that Tilda Swinton brings to this role. In the beginning of the movie, when her character holds a lot of power, she is genuinely terrifying. Like it is like, like, oh my God, like so good. So good. I know for a fact that if all if all the characters and all the people that we've ever talked about on Interstage Window like existed in a room, she mm-hmm. and Umbridge would mm-hmm. hang out and have tea, mm-hmm. and there and and then she would girl boss Umbridge. Yeah, and besties. Umbridge- Bestie. Bestie. She would be like she would be the dog friend, and then Umbridge would be the cat friend, right? And yeah, they would just be cat dog besties. Yeah, Absolute. it would be so. And and but like she plays it so well, and it's it's hard to play a unlikable character that sticks around for a long time. And Tilda Swinson, she does so amazing. Good. So and good. she is in like a vast majority of the movie, um, you know, as mm-hmm. as the movie kind of progresses. And of course, we will do a, a a plot summary as we always do. But as the movie progresses, the number of characters slowly whittles down and she's there until almost the end. She's one of the last characters yeah. to be removed from the narrative. Um, and, and it's very interesting because in the beginning, she's quite powerful and very scary. And as they kind of progress through the story, she slowly gets stripped of more and more of her power um, until eventually she's gone. Um, and uh, and and equally as well as she plays the part that's very terrifying, very like, oh, you know, like, oh, my gosh, I'm scared of her. Wow. Um, she equally as well plays like the timid, oh, no, I've been defeated. What the fuck do mm-hmm. I do now? How do I survive? Oh, God, let me completely change my person. Like, and she equally plays that like vulnerable, scared person that you know exists inside of everybody that is quite uh, blusterous as she is at the beginning. Uh, but those are two very different things for an actor to do. And she she pulls them off both incredibly convincingly um and and both very charmingly both both versions are very i think incredibly compelling to watch i think the shoe monologue in the beginning of the Mm. movie is a fantastically written and acted monologue Mm -hmm. that just like there's a whole monologue where she basically explains to people that they are below their shoe but below her shoe that she is better than them and it's just it's about it's how so the good. purpose the purpose of a shoe is to go on a foot and you are the shoes that go on the feet of the train. Yes. Um it's so good. And and the the thing that I think is so interesting about this character is that uh in the imagination of the the writers for this movie um this was originally a male and then um Bong Joon-ho the director had a, a chance encounter with Tilda Swinton and he thought, I think I have a part for this woman and uh, and gave her minister Mason. They really didn't change much. They really didn't change much. They, you know, just swap some pronouns around. And that's basically it. It's the same character. Um, and I can't imagine anyone better in this role. Like, and I've seen this movie several times. So there's a little bit of bias going there. But I'm trying to think like, who could do it better? No one. Absolutely no one could have done this anyone. better. Till this one well, is perfect. I also think that that's just like such a perfect, like, I love that story because it it goes to show, especially in 2007 when this movie was being made, that it's like, oh, you could have done this. Like, this is, this is, that is the choice that you can do. And it's just that easy to sit there and be like, oh, you have an actress in mind that could play this character that's supposed to be a man for no reason other than the fact that men are used to monologuing about power. Perfect. And Tilda was 100% the best option. So, yeah. Tilda Swinton as Minister Mason, favorite thing, absolutely was what made me fall in love with this actress. And of course, she always hits it out the park, but she especially hits it out the park in this one. So, so good. 
So that's my favorite thing. So so with that being said, um, Landon, uh, what what did you pick for your favorite thing out of the many many in this movie? Oh, um, I am a sucker for the set in this movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, specifically this one, <laughs> the uh, the aquarium train part, but how everything is so put together and makes you feel so inside the movie because the set is literally this big because you're on a train cart and that's how small it is that all the little details add together and make it feel like you're there and are so perfectly placed and so immaculate just it blows my mind uh they blew it out of the park with this and it made me feel like I was there and it made me feel well, like I wanted to be there even though this is a terrible world to live in I was like wow I wish I was eating sushi on this train cart 110 percent right and I think it's so amazing because vast majority of this sh the shots in this movie are um shot in a set that's actually fully built I know oh my god we don't do that anymore in 2023 it's all green screens and crap Oh, no, we're getting the robot noise for Landon. I'm so sorry, you guys. Hopefully it won't be like that on the recording. Um, we still don't know how to fix it. I'm sorry. Um, so when it comes to to the sets in this particular movie, they built them all. And they, could, they couldn't they could build them all at once. So kind of what they had is like four train cars and they would build like the four train cars and they would film all the stuff for those and then they would tear it all down and then build the four train cars with new sets again and then film another section. And, um, you know, they don't do that and do it like that anymore. They do, uh, they do so much of this stuff with green screens and that's just not how they used to do it. And you can so tell in the way the sets just look absolutely breathtaking in this movie. Yes. Well, you have that. And then you also have a comparison to like the costuming and the acting and the way that we are watching these people interact with the sets, mm -hmm. both in the background and in the foreground. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's fantastic. really super amazing. Yep. So easily, easily my favorite thing. Yep, For sure. Hello, Rar. It's been a few weeks. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Yeah, it goes back and forth. It's something to do with the way OBS sees Zoom. We're going to have to try to come up with something else. But the problem is, is we can't troubleshoot it because you can never hear it except through stupid Twitch. So it anyways. Is, it's, yes. So, yeah. All right. But we, let's Shall we talk? <laughs> let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about a post-apocalyptic summary of this movie. And that's, oh, God, such a good picture. <laughs> <laughs> all right so it's a long one because a lot of it is important in the year 2031 which is terrifying to think about how it's closer to us now than it was the year that this movie came out than then the the year the movie came out so we're closer to that future than we are to the past it has been 17 years after the attempt to stop climate change and it backfires as a result of human interference it causes the world to freeze. The only known survivors live aboard a train called Snowpiercer as it continues to circumnavigate the globe that was the creation of a man named Wilford, and it was built by him prior to the climate change issue. The passengers on the train are segregated, with the elite in the extravagant first class taking up the first few cars, and the poor and imprisoned and illegal crammed into the, the tail compartments. They are overseen by armed guards and often left to starve or for their or for their children to be taken without warning. Urged by his father figure, Gilliam, Curtis and his second-in-command, Edgar, lead a, the tale of passengers into a revolt after they realize the guard's weapons have no amu ammunition as the result of past revolts. Gilliam encourages Curtis to make it to the prisoner cart to free Namgoon, who is a, the security specialist on the train. He was arrested for his addiction to a drug called Cronol, and he is insistent that they also free his daughter, Yona, uh, and only agrees to help them if they pay him in this drug as they move forward to the front carts. Uh, 
Namgoon helps the tail mob progress forward, and as they find themselves facing guards with axes and other weapons overseen by Minister Mason and the cruel first class who often come uh, who often comes to take their children away. During the battle, the train goes into a tunnel, causing total darkness. The guard force, who have night vision, began picking off the blind rebels. However, the tail sections launch a counterattack with torches and push the guards back. Edgar is held hostage, but Curtis abandons him to capture Minister Mason, forcing her to order the remaining guards to surrender while Edgar is stabbed. The tail army stays back as Gilliam insists that they that they have gone far enough and can now negotiate with the guards' lives and the water system. Curtis continues on and takes Minister Mason, Nangoon, Yona, skilled fighter Gray, Tanya, and Andrew, who are two parents of children that had been taken prior, towards the front of the train. Curtis group travels through the several opulent cars, including a schoolroom where the teacher is indoctrinating the children on Wilford's greatness. That's the song we heard earlier. They seem unaffected by the rebels' interruptions. All the while, Namgoon and Yona recognize the landmarks outside and consider that and consider that the ice may be thawing. Suddenly, there are guns shooting, revealing that they have that they have but have had bullets all along, and many of the rebels and and army men lose their lives. And on the TV, there's a broadcast of the execution of Gilliam and other tail rebels which prompts Curtis into killing Minister Mason. Only Curtis, Namgoon, and Yona make it to the last car. And here Namgoon reveals that he is not an addict, and the reason that he has been collecting his the drug was that it could be used as an explosive to escape the train, because he believes that they can survive. Curtis stops them from blowing up the train because he wants to meet Wilford, to ask him why he has created this closed economic ecosystem that has resulted in the many of the tail end residents to turn to cannibalism. Curtis meets Wilford and to his shock learns that he and Gilliam conspired to stage Curtis's rebellion to reduce the tail section's population to sustainable levels. Wilford orders 74% of the tail passengers to be killed and then he offers Curtis the position in leading the train. Tempted by the call of power, Curtis appears ready to accept, but then it is revealed that Andrew and Tanya's children are working on the engine to replace the pieces that have been breaking during the 17 years of its running. Appalled, Curtis knocks Wilford out, rescues Timmy from the machinery, loses his arm in the process, which is a wonderful symbolism, as the heroic as the heroic tailies have sacrificed their limbs, literally, to feed each other, and now it is time for Curtis to do the same. There's an explosion that triggers an avalanche that derails the wrecked train, and with Namgoon and Curtis gone, Yona escape the wreckage with Timmy. They see a polar bear in the distance, indicating that life does exist outside of the train, and the bear notices them. And that's the end. <laughs> so good. It's so, so good. good. So good. So yeah, I don't know. I think you I think you did manage to cover all the important pieces. Um oh, there's I so hope. much there's so much that uh, that she didn't say that is still there for you in the movie if you haven't seen it yet. Tiny little details and things that connect things and just kind of the way that rebellion works that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So good. Oh, it's so good. So now that we have kind of caught you guys up on um, what happens in Snowpiercer, if you haven't seen it, let's talk a little bit about the history of Snowpiercer. Um, There have been many, many versions of Snowpiercer, but it started with a French graphic novel. So there was a French graphic novel um, that actually went through several authors. Um, We only have two hours, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but it is absolutely fascinating, the the French graphic novel scene at the time and all the things going on within it. Um, and there is a, a really great homage in the movie to the French graphic novel. All of the drawings that you see the quote unquote photographer, right? The photographer's drawing all the scenes of the people's kids and things um, that to like take photos because they don't have a camera. Um, the, not the actor, but the actual drawings themselves were done by the, um, the latest, uh, artist of the, the graphic novels. So there, there is quite a lot of like that sort of thing going on. 
And it's very, very interesting because this comic was not incredibly popular in France. I mean, it wasn't unpopular. Like, I don't want to, you know, pretend like it was some like super duper underground thing. That's not <laughs> the, the hipster. Case. But it 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 wasn't super popular. It really didn't have a huge amount of international appeal either. But um, some enterprising Korean pirates uh, created a Korean version. There was no official Korean translation. And Bong Joon-ho happened to find this Korean translation in a comic book shop. And he sat in the shop and read it. And that is what inspired him to call up the rights owners and say, hey, I'd like to make a movie of your comic book. And um, there's a very funny interview with the, the guys that own the comic book um, at that time saying, uh, thank you so much to the Korean pirates. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And here's some lunch for me. Thank you. Um, so, so that is kind of how it became this movie. And then the movie itself, again, not super popular, right? Like it's kind of a cult classic. It really got a very limited theater release. Very, very limited. And then I think it... It, it hit the right people though yeah which is yeah. what caused that yeah yeah they got McAllister's I got a big old potato <gasps> yeah. jealous Landon, if you want to go some? get a snack <laughs> if you want to go get a snack go for it I feel like I'm, I living, have... on, I'm living in the um the front cars now classic la <laughs> classic Landon snack right here I got some M&M's <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so they they basically uh have this movie with the very limited release oh thank you um to to the u.s but in south korea where bong Joon ho is from it's huge okay this movie is like their terminator even if you've never seen train uh snowpiercer you know everything about snowpiercer like it's referenced all over the place constantly y'all yes. there's a bts music video that is snowpiercer like it is gigantic in south korea like i cannot underestimate how huge this movie is over there and um and even in the u.s for the people that saw it like it was loved like i will tell you when i first saw it because and we'll talk about this in a second. It's got like a this very international cast and crew, right? And so a lot of it's in English, but a lot of it's not. And I didn't realize we were supposed to actually understand what the Korean people were saying. I watched it without the subtitles. I had no idea. And I was like, I guess we just don't know what he's saying. Whatever. That's like the theme. That's like the, the vibe of the movie. No, it has subtitles. We just didn't turn them on. <laughs> Whoopsie. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I'm I, curious, kind of before we go into the cast and crew, Landon, what was your first experience with the Snowpiercer movie? Like, because I watched it, like, when it is when it came out on streaming after it'd been out for a minute. I watched um, it after streaming. I definitely yeah. didn't watch it in theaters. Um, I think I watched it. I don't even know. I think I, I watched it on Netflix. I was just like, oh, this looks cool. Let me watch it. Um, it was definitely like I knew who Chris Evan, Evans was. That's why I, we like, watched didn't, it too. We were like, oh, sci-fi like, with Chris Evans, yes. With Chris Evans. <laughs> but I didn't know. And I'll be honest, it like was not the vibe that I was looking for on the first one. But what I then noticed, like the first watch, it wasn't the vibe that I was looking for. But then I noticed that after that, there seemed to be a resurgence of this sort of space in the sci-fi world of the post-apocalyptic sort of like weird way of the world so things like black mirror started getting extremely pop popular uh mm -hmm. snowpiercer okja which is by the same we'll talk about that in a second um by the same director all of these uh, there seemed to be like a lot of those of that genre coming out and as i dived into that genre i then revisited snowpiercer and i realized how amazing it was as a movie <laughs> and you know what even if this isn't your vibe y'all there's nothing better than watching chris evans kick someone's ass no. like i'm sorry like he, that he just looks so hot when he does that so if that so, helps and also like this movie <laughs> also like you're like man chris evans captain america greenland like not green lantern he was what he was part of the fantastic four right yeah. you're just like man He's just, you know, a pretty blonde boy. Oh, my God. This man can mm -hmm. act. Mm -hmm. He can act. 
He's so I'm like, good. holy shit, he's so good in this movie. So good. Um, like there's there's just harrowing times and him talking about like his trauma that he's gone through. It's just like, holy moly, dude, yep. I didn't know you had it in you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I mean, you probably uh, have seen the meme. And the the meme of this comes from this movie, his monologue about eating babies. And in the meme version, it's funny, haha. But y'all, in the movie, it is gut wrenching. It is gut wrenching and horrific. And like you feel so bad for this man. So bad. Um, yeah. yeah. While he's talking about eating babies. Yeah, you feel bad. You do. <laughs> you do. Because like he it is this terrible thing that like he obviously had to go through and has been carrying a lot of guilt about mm-hmm. uh, that a lot of people have had to go through uh, on this in this world. And so it's we, just like, holy shit. Yeah. So let's talk about the the, the cast of this movie, yes. the cast and crew. This is a truly international movie. And and that is such an interesting thing, I think, for like uh, myself as an American to watch because so many movies are so American, you know, or. I watch a lot of anime and animes are so Japanese, right? Or like you watch a Bollywood movie and oh my God, it's so Indian, right? But this yes. is truly an international movie. The cast is um, Americans and Koreans mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, some some uh, Europe, UK people as well. You, you, and yeah, some, Euro- yeah. some Eastern European too. Yeah, yeah. Too. And, then, um, and then it was filmed in the Czech Republic because at the time... They were the ones that had the biggest like warehouse and they needed a warehouse to build the train car sets that we talked about earlier. So it was filmed over there. But it also was so it was filmed in Czech Republic, like filming studios Mm -hmm. and warehouses, but it was an American production company Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was producing it. So Mm -hmm. it had influences from both sides and obviously an incredibly Korean director who had already Mm -hmm. started making his name for himself and had the history of, of that culture in the story that he wanted to tell that then came from a French story. Mm -hmm. So there's cultural French, there's French, uh, what's going to call it? Um, Like culture hints in there even if they were washed, even though they were changed, there are still some things that exist because it exists in the story. Yes. And like, um, and like, in addition to that, the special effects house was American because there were no special effects houses in Korea at that time that could do what Bong Joon-ho wanted them to do. Now, obviously, Korea's film industry has gotten like buku better since then. But at that time, that you know, the South Korean um, special effects houses couldn't do couldn't do what he wanted. So he had an American one, right? Yeah, it was. This was unfortunately during not unfortunately, but this was during the time of the great transferring of like special effects was it was just taking off, and every mm-hmm. year was different, and new strategies were coming out at at, at a breakneck pace. And obviously, the American industry, which is the world's largest media and film industry, was able to keep up much faster than smaller industries such as Bollywood and Korean mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and other places. Yep. And I mean, if you can't tell from the summary that uh, Landon gave, uh, a lot of this movie is about class dynamics. We're going to talk about that when we get to the themes. But because it's like so it got such a s- international cast and crew, I feel like they were able to bring all these different perspectives and really mm-hmm. portray the class dynamics as um, a worldwide problem that we are yes. facing. And you really feel from this movie like, oh, this is our world's problem. This is not yes. America's problem, right? There was this an- is the world's problem. The way we are living right now, the way we are treating our planet, the way we are treating each other is a problem. Yeah. There was a neutrality in classism that existed because it wasn't like what American classism looks like. Because at no point in time, like if this was a story of American capitalism and classism, you would want, you would see a lot more people in the tail trying to prove themselves to get out of the tail rather than fight against the industry. Uh, The same thing, like, and you would see a lot of the nuances of each culture and how they deal with the club the classism in there but because it was international it it neutralized all of that that Mm -hmm. like okay that well that way also goes directly against the way that the korean class system works so it can't be an american class system it has to be a little bit more traditional and what it's just left with is segregation and revolution Mm -hmm. because which is universal hurts us hurts us all it hurts us all 
Um, you know, Korea's got problems with that too, which brings us to talking about Bong Joon-ho and, uh, and his work overall. We wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so Landon, I know you've, you've seen several other of, uh, of Bong Joon-ho's yes, movies, so I, let's talk about them. I'll be straight up and say that I've never actually seen Parasite. It is on my list of no, movies that I've Parasite's wanted to so see. so good, girl. It's I so know good. it's so good. I know I've, I've read reviews. I know that it, it won, obviously, it. won Emmys. It's just like one of those things where, especially in the last two years of the world, I was just like, I can't handle any more existential crises right now, okay, and this you know will what? cause one. Hey, here, I'm going to sell them movie to you in a way that I that I know will, yes. will work for Landon and then you can maybe you'll watch it in the next couple of weeks or something okay it is not only about class struggle it is about a fucked up family dynamic too there you go God, sold <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, Bong Joon-ho. <laughs> Bong Joon-ho. Love him as a director. Okja was one of, was surprisingly one of my favorite Netflix original movies that I've probably ever watched. Mm-hmm. Okja is about the industry of they basically create these tiny little adorable things that obviously grow into much larger things and then exploit them uh, and uh, continue to exploit them. And it's the story of a girl falling in love with them and being like, we should probably not exploit the things that are good for us. Uh, Again, kind of a tale of capitalism and society, but uh, this is going to be a house. I mean, if it's not, if Bong Joon-ho is not already a household name, it, he will be. He is the director, I think, of this generation. And if not of this generation, then certainly of this genre. Of of getting us to think about the way that our world interacts with the world as a whole. Um, And making movies that really get us to question what is the point of our existence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And at this point in time, from the movies that I have seen, he has not missed. There are certainly movies that he has created that have not necessarily been for, like, directed towards me as a white woman living in America. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> but certainly um, have resonated in a lot of different ways. And and I, can, I only see that continuing. Yeah, I mean, Bong Joon-ho at the end of the day, loves three things, okay? He loves three things. He loves critiquing capitalism, he loves interesting family dynamics, and he loves kinetic action scenes. And so if you like these things, and like everybody likes these things, like if you say like, ah, that's not really my cup of tea, I don't know what's wrong with them, sorry, you're a liar. Everybody loves these things. And so you should watch some Bong Joon-ho movies if you have never seen yes. them. And honestly- Unless you go back like really, really far, like when he was a baby director and really didn't know what he was doing, Landon's right. Like he basically never misses. If you watch anything that yeah. has any kind of like following or popularity or whatever, you're going to love it. And and the thing that I love about Bong Joon-ho is that he will do anything for his art. I have a little funny, a yes. funny story that I learned from an interview with uh, with Bong Joon-ho. I think it's, he was at some kind of con when he said this. Anyway, so when Snowpiercer came out, um, it was uh, a Weinstein Company release, okay? And in addition to all the things you're probably thinking about that Weinstein is known for, another thing Weinstein is known for is that anytime he his production company is releasing a movie, he asks the director to go back and cut like, I don't know, 20 minutes of the movie, whatever, like cut a, cut a certain amount. And he's thinking about this from a marketing perspective, right? Like, oh, okay, you're the director, you're the artist, there's stuff in there that's not needed that you you feel is important and cool, Right. Um, Because you're the director and you're very close to it. So, like, he's not wrong to ask his directors to do this. But Bong Joon-ho is a very smart man. And he knows that he loves family. And he knows Weinstein also. Family is very important to Weinstein. This is also known in the industry. Family is very, very important to him, right? So one of the things that Weinstein wanted Bong Joon-ho to cut was um, the fish scene. So the fish scene is an excellent fight scene that starts out with the enemy taking axes and slicing open a fish and wetting their blades with this fish blood. It is terrifying. 
Okay. Yeah. But it is also very confusing. If you watch this movie and you're like, what the fuck's up with the fish scene? Don't feel alone. Everyone wonders what the fuck is up with the fish scene the first time you watch the movie. Okay. I will give you a spoiler. The fish scene is there because it's scary. That's it. There's no deeper meaning, but that is not what Bong Joon-ho told Weinstein. Bong Joon-ho said, no, I can't cut the fish scene because my father was a fisherman and it's a tribute to him to have a fish in the movie. And Weinstein believed him. And now Bong Joon-ho didn't have to cut so much from his movie. It, what a goat. Like, amazing. Bong Joon-ho, just... we can all aspire to be as ballsy as you, to just come up with that sort of lie on the spot. Amazing. And again, and again, <laughs> clarifying, Bong Joon-ho's father, not a fisherman. No, just... it's a totally fake he made it up totally on fake. the spot because just he didn't decided. want to cut the scene because he thought it was a cool scene literally that's it he's like no i love that scene he's like you're you're a family man i'm a family man this is why it's important for family uh-huh. reasons and it's uh-huh. actually no just important because i want people to fear me <laughs> <laughs> he just thought the scene was scary and he didn't want to cut one of his and they put a lot of effort into that scene too like it's actually there's not a lot of blood in a fish i don't know if you know that but actually the the way that they had to like make that scene look good and scary was actually very complicated and challenging to film so <laughs> you know after you've poured hours and hours into making the scene finally look good and your producer goes i want you to cut the scene cuz i don't think it's that important you know you're going to save you're going to save your art you're going to say you're like no i poured hours into that are you kidding me you know so he did and, and he was successful and that's what makes him important. It's like, and like the other thing too is that this is an art. Mm-hmm. He has yet to lose, and wh- the reason why he hits so much is because he has yet to lose that aspect of filmmaking. It doesn't matter how much money it, something gets. It doesn't matter how many awards something gets. It doesn't matter like the the fandom or the cult following behind it. At the end of the day he is expressing art and creating art, which means that like he finds value in things like the fish scene. He finds value in things like the shoe being under the, like taking this weird picture, this sketch and including the sketches from the original comic and the shoe being, you know, so such a, such a metaphor. Like these are the things that he values and wants to carry on and will fight to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so him being an artist is definitely like yep. a huge part of it so, so like we love him we love him and since snow piercer if it's got bong joon ho's name on it i'm gonna watch it i'm gonna watch it yeah yeah uh and and then i want to go into because we're talking about his the, that this is an art i want to talk about the art of, of snow piercer mm. like mm-hmm. what makes this movie in particular fucking beautiful mm-hmm. uh and it goes from things like the point, like something so subtle as the point of view mm-hmm. um, because of, and I talked about how much I loved the set, but because the set is so small and you are inside a smaller area than an open room or any landscape, because of that, it, inherently, there is a first person point of view feel to it and instead of trying to get rid of that instead of just trying to let that go to the background uh they made decisions to highlight that whether that be the Mm -hmm. shakiness of the camera whether that be the directional cuts whether that be how they exposed uh the room to the watcher there are intentions for every single shot Mm -hmm. Um, And there are only a few places in this movie that are not like either a mid-range or a close-up shot. There's only a few times where you you shot from far away. Like things that come to mind, for example, is when they're escaping the tail end of the train and they reach windows for the first time and they look out onto the landscape. So that is like a far away shot, right? Um, When they first get into the kind of like upper class areas right and they have this beautiful like faraway shot of the whole garden right that's well, um, and that's and the same yeah. thing happens in the sushi train too which shot like very low up high looking at the the fish you know or like when we first see wilford's car we get this beautiful shot of the entire car but most of the movie is not like that so the times that they use a wider shot it's always like very impactful oh and then it, and then at well, the end of course the whole landscape and the polar bear 
It's another yeah. one. And and then the reason for those shots too is uh, for most of these characters, that first shot of the wide shot of the landscape is the first time any of them have seen the outside since they were s- for 17 years. Mm-hmm. There are no windows in the lower in the lower cabin or in the lower train carts. So this is the first time that they've ever seen the outside and it's like this expanse of you were living in such small quarters to the world is so large Mm -hmm. unbelievably un ungivingly large and there is that huge shift and you feel that shift going from a third of the movie that has felt very closed in and tight to all of a sudden being able to see everything Mm -hmm. Uh, and then all of these examples with the with the carts and the trains it's to really symbolize the othering of this group of people of Mm -hmm. like they are not a part of this lavish industry that is existing on on board the ship or on board mm-hmm. this train that they are up that they are separated from it and you can tell simply by the fact that you get a wide view of plants growing or fish swimming or the uh, or the giant carriage uh, and engine yeah yeah um in addition to all the tight tight spots that you the tight shots that you see from the point of view that portrays the other beautiful thing about this movie is it is a series of excellent hallway fights oh my you god love a hallway fight oh my god has this movie got so many of them and they are all good okay it was very hard to choose which hallway fight to put a screenshot of in here now i chose chris evans looking badass but i almost chose the one guy um he doesn't have any speaking parts so i forget his name but the one that's got like the zillion zillion tattoos right there's the one of the very okay. first yeah one of the very first hallway fights is him after they've they've created this barrier um between all of the the tail carts so that they can keep the doors unlocked and he just like runs he runs across the barrier like doon, doon, doon. oh it's so cool oh it's so cool and that's the first one of so many so well, good and they and also like <sighs> So I am not the most cinematography person, but there is something so beautiful about how these action shots are shot. I feel like so much nowadays action shots are about quick cuts here, there, everywhere. Keep your eye here. Keep your eye here. That it's almost disjointing to be a part of the chaos or or it is like one long shot of like no cuts, which is interesting it it makes you feel like you're in the battle but it doesn't make it feel chaotic like that Mm -hmm. this doesn't do either of those things this has cuts but they're all purposeful and they and they add to the chaos rather than making you feel confused being there Mm -hmm. um so it genuinely does feel like you are watching chris evans fight while someone is coming with an axe to your head and it's like this is like it, it, and I and I know that this movie kind of makes me go like, gosh, remember how they used to do movies? But it just does over and over. It's like, you know how when you filmed a movie, you used to think about how it might be, affect the editing process? <laughs> remember how they used to do that instead of just filming a movie and be like, ah, we'll fix it in post. It's okay. Which is why there's so much chaotic, stupid editing to, nowadays. But this, every shot is so purposeful and it's so good. And you feel like you're there. Because whether the shots are fast or slow is, again, back to that first person perspective. The speed of the shot matches how the character feels. So when you've got a really super skilled fighter that's in their element, such as Chris Evans in this scene that I chose, or some of the things that the tattooed guy does, um, you'll have these like slow downs because they are experts at fighting they have been practicing and preparing for this and they know what they're doing they're they're very deliberate and so and you know like when you're in the zone like time kind of like slows down like it, it's different right when you've got all that adren- adrenaline going and you're super in the zone and you see that in the shots and then when there is chaos and when they're panicking when they're confused the shots speed back up again it's like it's just it's so purposeful and so good like Landon, why don't they do movies like that anymore? I know the I know <laughs> capitalism is the answer, but oh my god, oh my god, action movies can be really good. You guys, they don't have to just be fodder. And yeah, they're never. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I, and again, I think that that's like also the merging of genres here that kind of exists in that art, mm-hmm. art that like that comes with being an 
for lack of a better term at this point in time, an indie movie mm-hmm. of not necessarily having to care about, yes, at the grand scheme of everything, making money, but not how much yeah, money. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Bong Joon-ho don't want to starve. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm, and neither do, like, and we're not going to pretend that it doesn't cost millions and millions of dollars to make a movie. So not only does, does Bong Joon-ho oh not want to starve but none of the actors want to starve none of the producers i mean the producers are in the game to make money like that's mm-hmm. literally their job the the, fil- the everything about this is to make money but there isn't as much of a pressure to get like big box office hits when it comes to an indie movie mm-hmm. and because of that you can play away from tropes and and needing to like pop and needing to hit the correct calculation for what is popular Mm -hmm. you like you can it's almost like spicing up a dish Mm -hmm. and so being able to do things like have this be a anti-capitalist sci-fi movie but also like hold very few sci-fi roots so that it's like on the scale of sci-fi and fantasy like the only thing sci-fi about this is that the story is revolved around a technology that is within our human grasp Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't even feel sci-fi at that point literally Uh, the only thing sci-fi really the only thing sci-fi in this movie is the cockroach pellets (laughs) it's the cockroach pellets which Disgusting. actually not that sci-fi considering that that is like new form of uh, like it, it's already happening mm-hmm. like it, as far as like gastro gastro art is already starting to use insect mm-hmm. as a way to feed people mm-hmm. um so like what truly is the only element that keeps this in the realm of like fictional out of this world is the clairvoyancy of this child who whom we never really see as clairvoyant N- not exactly so Kuneko hello by the way we're about to talk about one of, another <laughs> one of my favorite parts of this movie so um something very interesting in both the comic version and the movie version of Snowpiercer even though it is very grounded there are these tiny little fantasy elements so in the movie the tiny little fantasy element is that this girl is clairvoyant And upon first watch, you might not even realize that she's literally clairvoyant because we only see it a little bit like she she tells them, don't open that door in during one scene because there's like a literal army that's about to kill them. And it is like a bloodbath. Like she's right. They should you know, they should have planned a little bit better before opening that door. But it was too late. It didn't happen anyways. And and uh, Chris Evans character, Curtis, turns to her and he's like, you know, are you clairvoyant? And she's just kind of like, eh. She doesn't, she gives kind of like this non-answer, like this little shrug, like she doesn't really say yes or no, but I think she is. After watching this movie as many times as I have, I believe she well, is clairvoyant and I believe it is purposeful that she is the fantasy element in her clairvoyance because she is the only character that truly sees life outside the train. And to yes. me, what that's saying is we are so trapped in our system of classism and capitalism and all of these things, that it takes an extraordinary power to imagine a world beyond it. And this is a true phenomenon. If you um, study fiction since the um, Mm -hmm. advent of capitalism, that there is this concept of capitalist realism where even artists who are the most creative people in our society struggle to imagine what it looks like after capitalism. It is much easier to imagine an apocalypse than yes. what comes after capitalism. Like, we don't know. And so I just... I and oftentimes, capitalism still exists within the apocalyptic theme. Most like, of the time it does. Like, think about it. Like, what have you... Like, what, think what of Walking, truly walking Dead is yes. one of, the, I think, one of the most phenomenon uh, post-apocalyptic fall of the world, long-standing yes. f- TV show. And man, do does capitalism come back real quick? It's there. Real it's, quick. It never leaves. It never leaves. It's there from season one. You see yeah. elements of capitalism playing out in the dynamics between the characters. And this is true of most, um, most, uh, you know, quote unquote, what like post-apocalyptic or post-capitalist media. Capitalism doesn't go away. And like, no. I am subject to this too. Like, how do we imagine a world that what, how do we imagine what economic system comes after capitalism? 
I don't know because economies are really freaking complicated. So I just love this idea that it takes someone with literal clairvoyance to imagine it and try to move society past it. I think on a metaphorical reason, like I love the decision of keeping it for the metaphor, for that reason, because I genuinely do think that that was the purpose of this character was to like really go to show like, and also in a way that like we don't understand. So it, not only do the characters in the world not understand her power or purpose for it, but at the same time, we as viewers don't necessarily understand it either because we never really see her have a vision or it's never really explained how she's clairvoyant. It's just things like don't open the door or knowing that Timmy is underneath in the engine. Like Mm -hmm. it's these tiny little pieces of knowledge that we never have access to understanding how she knows it. So that the metaphor of the metaphor of her having it, I love, but it literally is the only thing keeping this in the fantasy sci-fi. Yeah, pretty much the fantasy sci-fi genre. (laughs) Pretty much. Pretty much. Oh, that's so cool, Koneko. Oh, that's funny. I don't know if you're listening anymore because you went to dinner, but yeah, <laughs> those are those are two good nickels to have. Um, but I love I love her. I think she's great. Um, I do. I I personally now the ending of the movie is much more um, optimistic than the ending of the comic. So in the comic, they they make it to the the head of the train. And it's completely different characters in the comic. However, the the one that's that's Curtis, you know, not really, but the Curtis-like character from the comic, um, basically becomes in this situation where everyone on the train is dead except for him running the engine, and he doesn't know what to do. And so the comic ends with this idea that he just keeps running the train until the day he dies. Um, but the movie is much more optimistic. And the movie... There is the avalanche, the train tumps over, um, and we see two kids escape, the clairvoyant teenager and um, one of the little kids that was uh, that was that had become a, an engine part. But there's nothing that says more survivors don't exist. We mm-hmm. don't see anything or hear anything in the movie that says everyone else on the train died. That is very unclear. So I like to think it is optimistic enough that even more of the train passengers survived and they all went and made a little village in the snow. That's what I yeah. like to imagine. Because I think there's hope for us. I mean, you guys know that. I, I think there's hope for us, even with as crazy as our world is right now. And I'm also perfectly ending, willing to let it end at the end of the art and it stand for the idea of like they have detrailed, they have derailed the entire train of capitalism. And now the next generation has to go forward and create something new. I I am also okay with it just existing there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's a um, really good ending. I think it's really it nice. amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So. Let's take a small break and do our favorite sponsor, Audible. Ooh. Uh Karen, what is Audible? Oh my gosh, you guys. So um you should totally yeah. sign up for Audible at audibletrial.com slash interstage window. Um, that's what I use. So anytime that we're reading a book on stream, uh, 99% of the time, except for a, a few times that, um, that I'll not mention where I got the audiobooks else other ways, but most of the time I'm getting them from audible and, uh, and I actually love this service. I, I use it. I'm a customer. I have lots and lots of audible books in my library and I recommend that you guys use it too. And you can get a 30 day free trial. It's no obligation. So you can do your 30 day free trial. You can get your, your, I think you end up with two free books when you do the 30 day free trial, maybe just one. It depends on what specials it's, they're having right now. I think it's two. Yeah. I think it's two. Ooh, I think you get a sign up nice. bonus one and then your your first month one. Um, but you can go ahead, you can do that, and uh, and it's no obligation. So even if you cancel, you keep the books, okay? Because I've let my Audible subscription lapse before, and the books that you've already got, you still keep when that happens, okay? Um, you just can't get more until you renew, uh, and you can still access them. And um, and so you can do that, and then cancel it, and it still helps out the show if you do that, and you get two books. But I I promise you the service is good, and you probably won't just do it for that month, even if you cancel it right away. You'll probably renew it another time because truly. It is it is a very good service and with very good deals on the audiobooks. If you're busy like me, that's about all the time you got is for audiobooks, and so that's how I do them. Um, <laughs> so with that, uh, we all we do like to make a recommendation every week with Audible. So, Landon, what's our recommendation this week? 
So I we agreed on a recommendation and then I remembered another book. So I'm going to give you two this week. The first one should be the thing that we are reading together next, which is Hunger Games. We are starting our Hunger Games series starting next month. Yeah, or are we March. watching in March. in March? We don't have a specific date in March yet, but we will keep you guys no. updated on when that's going to be. But it will be in March. We will be w- reading and discussing the YA uh, phenomenon that is The Hunger Games, the, the first book. Uh, the, In my opinion, the audiobook is fantastic. It is one of the audiobooks that I own, not only to listen to it for myself, but also so that my students it can enjoy it. It is narrated by the ineffable Mrs. Orphan Black, Mrs. Which She-Hulk. Is, uh, She's amazing, really great narrator. She is great. Uh, and also makes just, I love like, it's a movie in your ears it's fantastic <laughs> um and then as we were talking i was like just thinking i was like oh sorry bye blah blah blah. and then i forgot and remembered and was looking at my audible uh i am reading ender's game to my class right now so i am being my own audiobook but i have also purchased the audiobook on audible.com by orson scott card which is a sci-fi young adult novel as well about capitalism and the effects of war and uh mostly colonialism existing within our society and i feel like that that also kind of has a lot to do with what we're talking about on snowpiercer so if you're like Uh. into the sci-fi technology looking at the world in a different way international sort of like international creation uh enters game by Orson Scott Card, I think would definitely be another book that you should check out and listen to the audiobook on. Now, I wouldn't recommend the movie for that one. You can no, see the movie's movie terrible. Really also, it's so if you bad. Read just, just the first book, you're going to get all the best. Parts yeah, anyway. that's the other thing it's too. A, it's a series, but the rest of the books are no. <laughs> just the first one. I don't. I but pretend it's excellent. not a series. <laughs> Because it gets a little crazy. But the first one is fantastic mm-hmm. and has a lot of great themes and opportunities for summary, which is the standards we're working on in school. But also, just overall, fantastic book. The rest of it, and also Orson Scott Card, Card's whole ideology, can just be forgotten about. But the first book's excellent. If you've never read yeah, it before. Yeah, first one's great. If the if you've never read it before and you're a fan of this this type of like dystopia sci-fi, I would recommend the first one. Yes. I think that if you like Snowpiercer, you'd also like Ender's Game. And if you like Ender's Game, you'd probably also like Snowpiercer. And, and maybe so, someday we'll get we'll get an Ender's Game movie version that's actually worth a damn. <laughs> maybe. We won't. <laughs> we won't. I don't know. We we waited twenty we waited twenty three years for the first one and it flopped. It was not We're not gonna get it. it's so not good. I was actually like my rule. I was like hi guys you cannot watch the movie they're like because you don't want us to spoil it and i was like no because the movie and the book are completely different and you will hate the movie and you will hate the movie which will convince you that you will hate this book and i promise you that you won't hate this book yeah 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 i think that's a fair thing to tell a a group of teenagers because it's true no it's so bad so bad i'm sure that when the nostalgia mine runs dry they'll pick it up again that's what i'm hoping for and we'll actually get a good one but the problem is is then the rest of the books aren't good and they'll want to make a series with the rest of the books and then it'll be like i don't even know i don't even know but anyway the first book. (laughs) also the thing about the ender's game movie the other thing about the ender's game book is that it's just it's not it's not good to make a movie out of yeah i don't know it's not very the whole the whole point is not cinema it's not a good point to make them because it's like man we're anti-colonialism and really you fucked up by punishing people before they actually did anything bad and Mm -hmm. that's just like not a movie people and it's also playing video game like it's one kid playing video games for like 300 pages (laughs) But Landon, <laughs> these are Twitch viewers. They would. Oh, like you're right. Actually, they might like that. It's an actual play. Oh man, actually, I love you. you know chat. what? I love I'm you. Thinking, Thank you. I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking now. Rethinking this. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, yeah. generation I would like would it. Like I watch it. a lot of hours of Twitch. So yeah. No, anyway, you're that's absolutely. Our recommendations right. for today. <laughs> you should definitely go sign up for Audible. Um, like I said, this is this is a service that we keep putting it on. Um on interstage window uh as our sponsor because i truly uh use this service yes. you're the only twitch i watch oh my god my heart bless you thank you who oh. said that rar said that oh, we're the only twitch that she watches you're bless. my favorite thank you Bay. thank you so much i didn't know i didn't know i didn't know that they only watched us <laughs> 
Uh, okay. I love anyways, them. anyways, that's our that's our little plug for today. What's next, Landon? What are we talking about? All next? right. We're gonna go to themes because I love a good theme, especially when you put something artistic in front of me and story driven. I'm gonna sit there and be like, what exists throughout the whole thing to teach us lessons? Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some of the major themes. And of course, the first is not a secret. It's the danger and harm that classism and capitalism does to our society. Uh, Anyone didn't see this coming? Wasn't paying attention to this stream or the movie. (laughs) Yes. Um, (laughs) So the way that this works uh, is that when the train was being built, um, they kind of like rushed its first inaugural like leaving because the world was literally freezing over and dying and, and there was like mass starvation and, and mass, you know, um, poverty and things like that that were happening. So you could buy a ticket to the train and based on what ticket you bought determines which car you went into. And then in addition to that, a bunch of people that didn't buy tickets bum rushed into the train. And so everybody that didn't buy a ticket got pushed all the way to the back of the car. And then it was kind of like, like classed like that based on your ticket. There was also like hints of, well, not never directly stated uh, the, the concept of employees too. So there are certain employees like the minister uh, who was part of the first class and had purchased a first class ticket and then became an employee. But there's also things like, uh, you know, there's an entire guardian or the person who's passing out eggs or the teacher who I, I'm not convinced were necessarily first class people, but mm-hmm. more in the second class, they worked on the train and also got to live there because of mm-hmm. it. Because mm-hmm. um, there are workers too, like, yeah, as they progress through the Someone- train. Yeah, as they progress through the train, like they get past the the lower class part, which literally the lower class just produces children. That's all they do on this train. Yes. Well, and then an sometimes contribute until, unless no, they are summoned. There's yeah. Th- then that's the thing is that there is never an opportunity to contribute. There is never a want from the lower class even to want to move forward, other than to move forward because they're not being treated fairly Mm -hmm. there isn't a want to be like oh i can work hard enough up the ranks and if i buddy out to this guard enough i'll be able to go up to the second class there's no movement of classes um unless you are pull and even then this isn't a movement of class but if you have a skill that is lacking and wanted by any of the other classes they will then last resort come to the bat the the lower class and ask and this is shown in the in the idea of that they were asking for a violinist if anyone played violin and uh there was a moment in time where the violinist tried to negotiate and was punished for it uh and was taken like he was like if i go my wife also has to go and they were like fuck that and just took him uh and he was forced to play violin for the upper class yep and then um then as they kind of progress through the train you get like cars with workers, right? So they get to the food car and it's the yeah. the guy that works to produce the the bug bars, right? The bug protein bars. And then as they keep progressing, they get to cars that have, you know, upper class plus workers, such as the mm-hmm. garden or the, the aquarium cart with the sushi. And then eventually they get to the point where even the workers are not visible, you know, they're, yeah. they're just behind the scenes and it's just the upper class by themselves, such as the dinner car or the party car, where you really see, mm-hmm. you don't, I mean, there obviously has to be workers there, but you don't see them. They're like invisible, right? Yeah. Um, and they, they have, they have no interaction at all mm-hmm. with anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas the workers do play a fairly large role in some of those, like, especially the, uh, school cart and everything like that the work the garden cart i think is a good example because you literally see like the the gardeners and the harvesters and stuff people tending to the plants in addition to people like sitting and doing their knitting or their crosswords or whatever you know exactly yeah um so it, it it that like example of not and then also like this this it's never stated in the movie but knowing how long projects like this obviously take to make there is this like concept of going in before that the world prior to this train was already 
showing more of a divide in classes than our real life 2013 did. Uh, that because of the food shortages and everything like that, people were feeling a lot, a lot of separation. So the fact that there was this train being made that was only ever going to be accessed by a very, very, very small amount of class that then gave an opportunity to survive the end of the world, I think also speaks to the classism of it. So yes, mm-hmm. so it, it determining how much you paid and how much wealth prior to the end of the world determines your station in this, which again, mm-hmm. plays into that idea of classism of, of uh, you were born into it, that there is no free movement among classes, uh, but also that capitalism aspect of money talks, even if there isn't a capitalistic society on the train because money doesn't exist it's just a part of whatever class you're in uh there is still that undertone of capitalism and it's and it's become this um preordained thing Mm -hmm. um that uh that happens like it's it's considered like oh this was somehow like the natural order or something divine right um and uh and the entire system is considered in that way, um, sort of like this planned closed ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so what they end up with is Wilford becomes uh, basically a deity who uses his power and um, and a committee of of loyalists around him to determine what the level of population should be as if, you know, he has any idea or any right. but they literally have this revolution as population control. And you learn in the movie about past revolutions that have happened as okay. well. And they are all purposeful. They can, Wilford makes it very clear, they can squash a revolution the moment it begins to fester. And they don't because they know that if they let people just breathe, they will outgrow the train. Or they're scared of that. I guess they don't know because they've never let it happen. But they are convinced this will happen. And so yes. instead of trusting the population to to control itself, you know, instead of, uh, of of allowing something like a disease to sweep through the train and kill a bunch of people, what they do instead is manufacture these these revolutions um, and control the way that the food is is pushed out to basically make sure that the population stays the exact same number that it's always been for forever. Yeah, because of course they're they're continuously having children. Um and they're having more children than we assume people are dying of old age. Um so yeah, there those planned revo- revolutions and of course in the in the later half it is revealed that things like the concept of uh the first few months they all the lower class were not fed at all. And yeah, so they, they're they starving. There were too many of them. There, was there was too many, too many, many of them. passengers on the train so they were like, how do we kill them? Well, just don't feed the tail section. They just let a bunch of them die. Um yeah, d- just let a bunch of them die and that's the they ended up turning to ca- to cannibalism. To like um and not chaos cannibalism, but things like that that they were eating the weak, they were eating the people that were young, the babies. Um, but then also things like, hey, you can have my arm mm-hmm. or you can have my leg. Uh, sacrificing parts of their body for the survival of the whole, uh, which is an interesting concept of community that exists under this, in this lower class. Uh, and the fact that that level of community and the greater good of the community and the survival of everybody to the extent in which they can, rather than like turning on one of each other on one another existing in the lower class really speaks to that like i think uh the director and producer and writer's view of what that class classism looks like and that concept of connection existing in lower classes than it does in higher classes within society yeah, well, um, no matter which how is true much you tried to try to divide and dehumanize people there is still a strong drive for us to be collective and work together mm-hmm. and save our species as a group 
Um, you know, we can pretend in this country that rugged individualism is the most important in the natural state, but that's not true. There, There is no. a strong drive to protect yourself, but there's also a strong drive to protect your community. And I would actually argue that uh, in lower... In, in classes with lower, with higher poverty rates, with with higher homelessness rates, with uh, lower security rates, uh, they care more and have a larger community and a larger sense of looking at the community than necessarily people do of higher, uh, higher classes, quote unquote. Yeah, that does seem to be the um, case. And I think that that's something that if we really wanted to like explore that topic, looking at the way it's even portrayed in media, mm -hmm. like the way friendships of higher class friendships are portrayed versus are, are portrayed in media versus how the communities of lower class and, and more impoverished communities are portrayed, that mm -hmm. that that sense of we are family, even if we are not blood, uh, permanence well beneath well in lower classes and, and higher poverty areas than it does necessarily in, in higher uh or in more stable places and and the thing the thing is is that the person that create that sacrifices his arm first the first one to sacrifice body parts is gilliam and that's mm -hmm. how basically how he becomes the leader that's like what he does to kind of cement himself as the the tail end section leader and um I think that is very, very interesting because we find out, as you guys learned from the summary, that Gilliam and Wilford are working together. And essentially what that means is that Wilford, as their like god king of the train or whatever, recognizes that even though this lowest of the low class is not actually contributing, they are necessary. We can't just kill them all, right? Because if they could just kill them all, they would have never started they feeding them. They would have just let them continue to let them starve until they were all gone. But um, we still need those people for, and I um, think for like stabilizing the population, for having yes. children. Um, they're they're still they're still needed, and so that becomes the natural state of the train to just feed them just enough to keep them alive. And I think that that is really shown in, I don't, like, obviously it's never really talked about in the movie, but thinking about how that realization comes to be, because they were really, they, it was a few months before they started being fed. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, trying to figure out what was that, what was that realization? I do think it probably has a lot to do with capitalism oh, yeah. and the concept of it, because realizing at that point in time, the train might not have been broken or the pizzas might not have started be breaking. But realizing that like, oh, one day we're going to need people. Like if a worker dies, someone's not going to come up from the first class and then start willingly working. We have so a place to replace them from. We, we have to have spare parts to replace mm -hmm. them from. And those spare parts can come up from the lower areas. So I think that that realization of, okay, there has to be, there has to be some sort of movement to lower to middle class um, because we cannot sacrifice the stability of our upper class because that then shatters the illusion of safety and control and all of the things that we're trying to protect. Right. Um, and that and that might be that those are the people that might actually have the power to change things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that that's that is an interesting thing of like, oh, that really makes you think about how did we get there? Um, and hello, welcome back. Uh, so, yeah, and I do I think, think that like when we're when we're talking about like where Snowpiercer is at the time of the movie, when we see when we see them. Right. And where they are, you can totally imagine um, to go back to the Hunger Games. Right. That we're that we're going to mm -hmm. cover next month. It was month. same. It was you, same area, yeah, by the way. It you was can same totally era. imagine that if the train never derailed and the train kept going, they would need like more and more elaborate ways of giving people hope to be able to move up to the, the mm -hmm. upper classes um, to kind of like change the revolt structure as the train kind of kept going and kept like you can totally imagine a future where they have to do some hunger games type of thing 
I think that we would have seen the classism descent into capitalism yeah. of uh, the, right whether back. it whether it be money or whether it be standing or whether it be just like this reward of eventually you can be part of the first class because people mm-hmm. in the first class are going to start dying out. Um, so so this concept of that there is a momentum forward mm-hmm. Uh which I also like because this concept of there is a momentum forward, we're on a train. Yeah. We're on a train that is headed in one direction. And there is a meta, like if you don't think there's a metaphor attached to that, there is like, not only are we forward moving, but there's also this con and throughout the movie, not only are we forward moving on a tri- train track, uh, but we're also forward moving from the back, very last carriage to the very, very front. Mm-hmm. So we are experiencing this forward movement um, that is that is existing not only in the societal aspect or would one day exist in the societal aspect, but we're we're watching it happen as the revolt happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and we're also, also watching, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Keep going. I was going to say, well, you're also watching as that forward movement happens, less and less people are allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. We are seeing like, oh, it'd be everybody in the beginning trying to move forward and then it'd be five and then it'd be three and then it'd only be one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that concept of like, oh, it's getting, they're, they're weeding out and people can only go so far. Mm-hmm. And as we're progressing forward, you have to remember the train is also circumnavigating the globe. So it's going in a cycle. So it's in this yeah. like perpetual motion that will never stop and never go backwards until someone literally clairvoyant <laughs> derails things. Right. And I do, yeah. I do um, identify with that for our world. Like the farther that we go, the more I think like, my God, is it going to take a literal like magic <laughs> to to make us do better? Um, well, it's it's that concept of history repeats itself. Yes, it's like yes. history repeats itself. Absolutely, but so does the system. And yeah. and we're on a train that is preordained and predestined train tracks, and it is falling apart. Like that's mm-hmm. the other thing too that exists in this is that the train itself is falling apart and it is abusing and using the lower class people to continue to put it on the rails mm-hmm. uh, in hopes that it doesn't fall off. And, and and there's that same metaphor there exists there. Uh, and then of course, the at the end of the day, what really truly happens is that the only way to stop it is to blow it up. Yeah. There is no pulling the brake because the idea of the pulling the brake, the freezing, it's that fear of we're going to be frozen. The only thing that's keeping us warm and safe is that we're forward moving. Mm -hmm. And so the only way to stop forward motion is to blow up the train. And I think that that kind of brings us to the next thing that we wanted to talk about, because it's not just about the way that they perpetuate classism and capitalism through these kind of very, um, you know, these very like technical, very tangible means. There are all there's also a lot of like soft power going on in the way that the culture of the train is shaped. Like, okay, we played the song at the beginning. We played this and it's literally an indoctrination song. It literally like, you know, (laughs) and it's, and that song amuses me. It does, but I can't say watching it, it doesn't feel a little bit like being forced to stand up and put your hand over your heart for the Pledge of Allegiance. That's what those kids are doing. That's what they're doing. They're being um, told that this, this is how it is and this is how it always will be. And we have to do this because if we don't, we're all freeze and die. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're pulling the kids, we're pulling the kids right in. (laughs) <laughs> we're pulling and the kids right in <laughs> i also think that that it's it, there is an intentionality of the, the most we see as many kids as we see or or people who either are kids or who grew up with the majority of their lives on the train that we see people who had experiences off the train uh, and I think that, that is something that's also incredibly por- important to consider because it's like, okay, they never knew another life. Mm-hmm. Like there, it is harder 
to go into the unknown that it is to go back into the uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And for them, and the longer this train is navigating the world, the more it is the unknown. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, and it's because been, they've been we have... on the train 17 years at this point. Yeah. I mean, think about how, how our country was 17 years ago. You almost can't, it's even hard to like remember, you know, mm-hmm. what we were going through as a country 17 years ago. And I think that that's probably true for anybody listening, thinking about their own country. Like, gosh, the political landscape was so different 17 years ago. You know, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to make the connection from then to now um, as like a, as like a constant thing, as a perpetual thing, as something that's that's not completely completely different, even though there's probably more similarities between now and then um, than we would like to admit. But it's hard to see them with our limited frame of reference yes. and the limits of human memory. <laughs> um. Yes, absolutely. And and it uh, it does get to me on the the, the similarities do get to me of like the indoctrination of belief of sitting there and and praising uh, the creator of the train uh, as almost like a god or as almost like just something to pledge to and yeah seeing those little similarities in the world is it's part of what makes this movie scary yep and then the whole reason that this slide is titled culture is something that um that Landon actually pointed out when we were discussing this movie and discussing okay like what parts do we want to talk about during stream right and um and she was like you know it's very interesting that uh that they that the people that are in the upper classes especially um but also sometimes in the tail section this happens they have a lack of response to things that are incredibly abnormal so mm-hmm. a really good example of this is when everybody when everybody looks out the window at, at the seven frozen you know revolters that escaped the train all those years ago and then froze to death right and they and to them this is like this interesting like little holiday you know like there's not there's nothing it's a landmark it's a landmark it. yeah it's 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 a landmark that they go by every year um you know it's not <laughs> don't think too hard about thanksgiving guys um yeah. it's kind of like that for them and it is it is culture becoming the response to their trauma and yes. once the trauma becomes culture then it is normal and acceptable and healthy all of a yes. sudden, even though it's the same thing as when it was trauma. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, don't think too hard about it. Don't don't wish anything else. The fact that we're only yeah. allowed to have sushi two days a year is because of an overpopulation of the fish of the fish. And so we want to make sure to population control the fish. And but instead of saying it that way, we're going to have it be a celebration. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna, it's gonna be, be fun. fun, or like it's gonna be it's gonna be an amazing thing to celebrate. Yeah, or like how their how the train history is all about a series of revolts, and these are just planned revolts that happen so often. And this is just kind of you know these these sorts of conflicts are just part of life on the train. Yep. It's part of our culture to have an understanding of these revolts and to teach the kids why you as the upper class are never going to be part of these revolts, right? <laughs> well, and then also like we see it in the concept of like they when they do become a part of the revolt, when all of a sudden men who are dirty and d- dressed in black comparison to this beautiful colorful room full of children, they enter uh and the kids have no reaction no none. and uh, several reasons being that they probably never known a stranger because they live on a train but also because it is that like don't pay attention to the thing that you're not supposed to pay attention to we're not a part of these revolts so we're just not mm. going to pay attention to it we're not going to ask questions outside of what the things we're supposed to ask questions on and it is that like idea of the willingness of naivety and being and being unaware and that choice is indoctrinated to us as as kids because we're told told, not to ask questions and they're told this is the right reaction too i can't remember if it's the teacher if it's minister mason that says it i think it's minister mason um that literally tells the kids like oh it's just some tail section passengers they're just like you they're cool you know some is the the character she says something like that and um and kind of like you can see the the kids like oh okay my reaction is correct let me continue this and then they continue that that lack of reaction um all the way up until the guns come out (laughs) yes 
And then, but then we see that lack of reaction a little bit less so. Well, we see that lack of reaction definitely in the dance cart, where mm-hmm. the only thing that has any sort of reactive thing is the concept of drugs. Yeah, and then we like see when, when the when the security guy and his daughter start steal, stealing yes. all their drugs and coats, all of a sudden they start reacting, but they They're don't starting react to be reaction. until all of a sudden the guy starts coming and taking their stuff. <laughs> yes. And so it's a reaction of the effect on them rather than the thing that is happening in the world as soon as in the world it starts to affect them then there's cause for concern if it doesn't affect them then it's no questions no don't care sort Mm -hmm. of thing Mm -hmm. well that sounds pretty familiar right Mm -hmm. uh and then so you so and i guess again like it's not perfectly but it's like this idea of concept of ages you have the schoolroom, which is all children who were born on the train you have uh the drug or the dance room which is supposedly young adults who remember a life maybe prior to the a train but it's might also been 17 not years so it, they might have been not born on the train but they probably don't remember And then you have the upper class, which is full of the adults and people who have a little bit more of a like, oh, what are they doing? Like there's a there's more of a reaction, but also not an outright reaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's still a there's still a I'm not going to mention the thing, but we're definitely noticing the thing. I do kind of feel like it's a little bit like um, I'll, I'll, I'll give an American example of something that it's like this didn't used to be this way. Um, TSA checks at the airport. Going to the airport used to be so easy. You would just go and you would get on the plane and it was no big deal. And that's not the case anymore. And you can definitely Mm -hmm. tell there is more patience for the insanity of the process. The younger that you are and the less that you remember it. Whereas if things don't go smoothly through those checks, the older that you are, the more likely you are to, uh, for lack of a better word, suddenly become a Karen and get very frustrated and bossy. Um, yes, uh, because you remember what it used to be like, and how in how in your body you can feel how ridiculous this is. And I think it's and the it, same as the what you see on the train. And it can also be for negative things as well, such as like for for me, I know one that's real life is uh, the concepts of school street shootings mm. of 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 this idea of this happening well guess what my kids live in a world where they've had to practice school shooting drills every single year for the entirety of their lives as someone who also grew up with knowing it existed but didn't have to necessarily practice drills every year but definitely lived in a culture in which it was a reality I have a different reaction and a different way of that than compared to my mother who never had to experience that as a in the school system and so like that also change of culture and it is once again normalizing the trauma that is existing in these people's lives Mm -hmm. so that it no longer raises red flags when it's something that is incredibly bad that should not be happening because the more separation you get away from it the less likely people are thinking that it's abnormal or wrong yeah yeah it's kind of like a tiktok that i saw recently um, where a teacher, uh, they did him, him and his class did a funny skit about the, um, the pee bucket that all the classrooms have now. And, um, and everyone got really mad. Like, I can't believe that a pee bucket even exists in a classroom. And he had to make a, cause people didn't get the joke. He had to make a follow-up video where he pulled his class. Like, do you guys even know why we have one of these? And they didn't know they were like making all kinds of guesses. And he, and he finally was like, no, the reason why we have these is because of school shootings. And what Mm -hmm. if we're trapped in our classroom literally all day? That's why we have this. And it was like a very serious video. Um, But it was the same thing. Like all these older people commenting, they didn't even, they didn't know, they thought like, oh, you're just making light of something, you know, and why do they even have it? Like schools shouldn't have this. What the heck? You know, they thought he was just making it up. Like it was some kind of joke, but no, he was trying to to make light of something very serious so that the kids wouldn't be so scared. That's what Mm -hmm. he was doing. Um, Very, very tragic. Very but then as those but then as those those kids grow up the concept of a pee bucket bucket is going to be normal for them yeah and so there is never going to be any outrage outside of what's happening right now yeah yeah absolutely um and it's and that's shown in this like the 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 way it's so subtly and yet masterfully masterfully shown is what makes this movie and this this theme 
amazing. Isn't this real? It's real too. Like now that we're saying it's this, so you can, real. Probably, you can probably think about plenty of examples of real life cultures that they do weird. Oh. This group of people does weird things because of response to some kind of old trauma. You know, Ra- like yeah, racism exists yeah. because of, like in the same way that this mm-hmm. does. Like it, it's it, it's <sighs> nothing happens to everyone. Things are a process because there's a movement forward and whether that be movement forward through generation or movement forward through time, it just so happens that in this particular instance, the metaphor exists in different parts. So it's easier to swallow, uh, but it, it, it permeates. Makes it, very cinematic. Our, it makes it very <laughs> cinematic, obviously, but it also permeates throughout our entire, our entire culture. Mm-hmm. And this is a way of, of showing that. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, and I think that things like th- those subtle details, the things like the showing of the of the seven explorers and the lack of humanity that is attached to the fact that we celebrate watching human, like we celebrate pa- the passing of different human bodies every single year. And it's no longer about the humans that left and tried to do this brave thing, but is now about the fact that, oh, we made it another year around around the world. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep, for sure. For sure. And, and I think that that um, that is not it's not just the culture either. Like we see this literally in kind of I think the next thing that we want to talk about. Um, and this is one of the things that Bong Joon Ho just loves. He absolutely loves crazy family dynamics. And there's yep. so much family dynamics in this movie that I swear the first time you watch it, you will not notice all of it. Um, Mm -hmm. for example, the two of the, like, just, they're like thugs, right? They just, yeah, those guys that, uh, that just, they're, they're responsible for a lot of the, the shooting. (laughs) They're gun, they're basically, uh, upper class, uh, security guards for the upper class and they shoot a lot of people and they're, they're brothers, they're, they're brothers. And they even have like this cute little sibling thing, like right after he, you know, this brother leans on the other shoulder, uh, eventually the other one gets annoyed and is like, he does this little number. Get the fuck off my shoulder. <laughs> it's like very funny. Um, very simple. Like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the movie starts out that way. One of the very mm-hmm. first interactions we see after the little like um, the little uh, title card and the little newsreel that explains the state of the world. The One of the very first things that we see that's actually like character interaction is the old couple where the man is taken for violin and he tries to tell the guard that like my wife's an even more talented violin player than I am. You should take her instead. You should take both of us. Da 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 da. And like that's and they're separated. So um, so what happens between families is incredibly important to this movie. There there are very few relationships in this movie that are not either family literally family by proxy or two people boning. I mean, that's basically every interaction in this movie. There aren't really friends. Not really. (laughs) All the friends become found family in this movie. (laughs) Well, they have to. I mean, because like the difference between, I'm going to like, they have to. There's so much trauma happening. And when you survive a trauma together, like your body biologically literally bonds with another person. Yeah. <laughs> so like yeah. you, you, there is a deeper codependency that exists that can like, that can like go towards that found family sort of trope yeah. uh, because they have to. But I also think that it's important to like realize too, obviously our protagonists exist in the lower and further back carts. So uh, where there's going to be a higher focus and a higher level of empathy for those characters. Mm -hmm. But four out of the six photos on here are all characters who are in that lower class. Um, Three of them, three of the photos or six of the people are obviously people who, who rushed the train and were there. And then two of the other one, and then uh, you have um, the two that were arrested and brought lower because of their addiction to drugs. Um, yeah. And, and you know, the that family connection that does drugs together stays together. Does drugs together stay together. <laughs> but that connection is something that they both value completely that he's like, his, his thing is like, I'm not doing it unless my daughter's coming. Um, and so and the, the fact the that... that he says that you think he's like this diehard addict, which 
he he isn't exactly an addict, you know, as as Landon explained in the summary. Um, but the truth is, is his daughter is more important to him than anything else. Period. Yes, and. and- but like the fact that the only people from the upper class that we ever see, uh, even though they're not from the upper class because they're prisoners when we meet them, are the only people that have family connections of the upper, like within the upper class. We see no other, truly, we see no other familiar connections other than these two. But even then, that's but they're subtle, working class on character. That's working class. And then everything about this chick is like not not straight up told to you <laughs> no. i mean you um, can assume that she's like a pawn of the upper class but she might be of like from the upper class and then got the teacher job like it's really unclear yeah. but something that you that you find if if you're obsessive like me and have seen a bunch of um interviews and behind the scenes stuff and and looked at the art book book for this movie anyways i could go on but it's it's heavily implied that that baby in her belly is wilford's baby so, like, that's the only, like, when it comes to the upper class family connections, there's that. And then it's not not pictured here, but uh, Wilford's guard lady, they are obviously boning. Okay, they are obviously boning. So different but, kinds of family connections for the upper class. But even then, like, that's, I, I would not even necessarily consider that familial. Yeah, like, because there type. isn't, there's not necessarily an emotional, we see a no emotional bonds between people of the upper class. Yeah. Uh, we see only emotional bonds between people of the lower class. Uh, the whole thing to get to the front is to figure out what is happening to the children that are being taken. This um, is one of the kids that gets taken right here. Yes, this is Timmy. This is Timmy. This is the one of the boys. He survives. Um, and so, like, it is this whole thing of that that again that community is so aware and connected in the lower class because that's all they have to survive that's all they have to keep going forward and they're willing to put their life on the line for each other Mm -hmm. whereas we see no emotional connection amongst the upper class like this teacher doesn't even like as a teacher who like cares about her students this teacher doesn't give a shit about her students no she doesn't (laughs) she cares more about killing the rebels than she does about her students she's the first one when shit starts going down to pull out a gun and start shooting the first one and she doesn't say and she doesn't address the kids at all she just assumes that they'll like duck and cover i guess she doesn't she just pulls out the gun and starts shooting that's it so that so those connections to one another, those emotional pathways being open, I think a huge theme in this is like showing how how much a classism and capitalism can get in the way of that, but also how much of it is necessary in order to survive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that if you're not doing it for your community, then what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. And I think even in the um, most dire of circumstances, that's what happens. Which I also think is like a huge American theme, but also shows just such an, a, a theme that is quintessential uh, under Asian culture, which is like so about family. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. much, I mean, obviously all Asian countries are different, but so much that permeates throughout a lot of the majority of Asian cultures is how important the concept of family and your roots and who you were and where you came from. Uh, and this, I think, shows kind of the balance of both those concepts and cultures brought together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, exactly. And and this particular theme right here, you will find present in every Bong Joon-ho movie. It does not matter what the movie is about. Like even here where family is sort of this secondary theme that supports the themes of classism and culture uh it's still like so ever present that we knew that we had to mention these family connections yes absolutely uh and then our final theme Mm -hmm. which is the environment this is at the base of everything this is a story of global warming or climate change Mm -hmm. um the world around obviously uh was starting to go bad because of overpopulation, over farming, um, and people were starving. There was a shortage of food. There was droughts. There was wacky weather, um, and as and in an effort to 
stop it from happening, humans overcorrected. And what we would uh, never do that. Never <laughs> shot drugs, shot a carcinogen into our ecosystem that caused an ice age to happen. Uh, and that idea of like humans were their own demise because of an overcorrection to a problem that they caused mm-hmm. is like just so on the nose about <laughs> climate change and environment. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, if we all just stopped using plastic straws, that will definitely fix it. That's, yeah, you personally, <laughs> hey, hey, you personally watching this are responsible for all the dead turtles because of the Starbucks <laughs> drinks you've had. You are. Not the big corporations that are contributing 90% of plastic waste throughout our entire world. It's not It's not the not, fishing nets from the fishing no, boats. No, it's not the fishing nets. It's certainly, certainly not amount, the amount of, uh, amount of CO2 that's put into the air by any sort of shipping companies that are shipping foods all over the world or any sort of uh or any sort of destruction of of uh forest deforestation or anything like that you personally are responsible so take that guilt (laughs) and go get a starbucks drink i mean (laughs) it's just crazy because the way that this and the movie is a lot more focused on capitalism than it is on environmentalism But the comic is a little bit skewed in the other direction. It's a little bit more environmentalism, a little bit less about um, classism and capitalism. But there's still so much of the environment in the movie. And uh, something that I find very, very interesting is that it is heavily implied within within the movie, at least all the passengers believe, that they are the only people left who's in the train. And there's no humans outside of the train three well rar you're not doing your part you know what i've killed four four whales with my plastic water bottles you need you need Good. to up your game friend <laughs> come on i personally am trying to take out all the rhinos of the world wow personally goals you're just you're just gonna girl boss your way into that <laughs> just, girl, just girl boss my way <laughs> into that yeah like tell uh, just <laughs> hell yeah that's what so, they call me. That's what the rhinos call me. They call me minister. <laughs> one up Ollie. Oh my God. I love it. One up Ollie. <laughs> Pri- yeah. Priorities. So, so yeah, I think it's very, so the, it's everyone on the train believes this. And I do believe that the movie believes this as well. Mm-hmm. Because if the, if the movie believes this as well, then what that means is all you had to do to fix climate change is just leave it the fuck alone. Just stop doing all the destructive things and it will like fix itself, you know? Um, well, it was also like the it was said in the credits that the big reason why they did this thing was because they couldn't feed people. Yes. Uh, and I was just like, yeah, but there was a company out there making a train for multimillionaires to like right. go around the world. So you could have fed people. Mm-hmm. You but just you chose to give you chose <laughs> yeah. to give the wealth to the top one yes. percent and let the ninety nine percent starve. Yeah. And so then what- instead of dealing with that issue, you thought, let's shoot the sky with something. That'll change it instead of having to, again, break the system. Exactly. Like they put all the billionaires on the train and then the world started healing. So all I'm really saying is we should probably take all the billionaires and put them on Elon Musk's Mars base and then the planet can start healing. Well, also like with that and also to prove that point, the train started falling apart. Like the train was fine. And then the billionaires went on it, <laughs> and then it started falling apart. <laughs> I think that that's the second point of evidence that it was like the world started healing when the billionaires went on the train, and the train started falling apart when the billionaires were on this. I don't care if there's cor- <laughs> if there's correlation does not equal causation here. This is my thesis statement. So the other really the other really fun part about the environment in in this is that because the environment is kind of what caused this the environment continues to be the punishment like literally when the lower class does some you know bull crap 
um, they they get frozen. They get their arm frozen. Like this is seen as the main punishment. Like what this like this he's about to get his arm shattered in this in this screenshot that's right above me. He's about to get his arm shattered. Yeah, he had to stick he, his hand out for seven minutes yeah. and it froze solid. And then it froze. And then they're gonna crash it with that hammer that's like right right behind him. So the what he did to receive this punishment was to take off his shoe and throw it at Minister Mason when she was being very fucking annoying. So, you know, the punishment definitely fits the crime here. Yeah. I do think that you should lose your arm if you throw a shoe at someone. That seems, uh, you know, pretty equitable Hold on. Um, and justified to me. I just had flashbacks <laughs> about George W. Bush on a military camp. So oh, my careful God. Careful with what you, you say. <laughs> and he, like, he like had dodged the shoe. Like, <laughs> it, was the, it was the second one that honestly was the American yeah, yeah, hero yeah. in that one. Uh <laughs> Yeah, no, I, so, but you would never like you would never see this. Um, you would never see this in the opposite direction ever. Like all the no. terrible things that the the upper train car members um have done, they don't they don't get their arms frozen off. The people that lose their arms in this movie is this guy Curtis and Gilliam, all mm-hmm. lower um all lower class, all tail section people. Yep, Bong Joon Ho loves removing arms. Does he hate arms? Is he anti-arm? Maybe. I think I think there's like a metaphor of usefulness, like that yeah, your yeah, yeah. arms are supposed to be what the thing that makes you work. And so if you take that away, then it's a break of capitalism. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Everything, I think everything that's actually is. the truth. Yeah. Um, but then also like, so yeah, the environment is used as a punishment. It's mm-hmm. a tool of fear. And I also think that people aren't, necessarily paying attention to the world outside the train well they can't in the um, tail section because they ain't got no windows no, n- not in the tail section but i'm talking about like because they don't ca- they don't need to in the mm-hmm. middle in the second class and first class sections they don't need to they have everything that they need mm-hmm. so there there isn't a need to be outside of the train their 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 needs are fulfilled so they're not looking to break the system the only people that really notice the difference are, are are the people that have had the luxury of and by luxury that's a big word of being in both are mm-hmm. are the uh Nangum and his and his daughter who uh realize that the ice is melting and that the world is correcting itself. And you know what I think is so interesting about that? I'm so glad you said it because it brings me to a very interesting point. So there is in one, one of the hallway fights in this uh in this movie, there's a section where the train tracks are such that like the train kind of does this big U shape. So the back of the train and the front of the train are like across from each other because it's making this big U shape. And these guys, these two, these two guys that are about to smash this, the dude's arm, right? They're in a shootout with Chris Evans and his group and they shoot through the windows. So like that betrays that they know that actually it's survivable to some degree outside, just like our security friend and his daughter know. And they are the only ones that could know those working class people that do work for the upper class. And so they are transient in some way between the classes. Yes. Um, And again, because also I think it has a lot to do with there is if the train is a metaphor for the system mm. there is an idea of the lower class has no way to even view what the world is outside of the system and mm. it's because there is an there's an aspect of survival that is existing mm-hmm. that you are mm-hmm. just trying to you are doing the most you can to do the bare minimum which is survive in the system that the world outside of it cannot exist and then you have the upper class, which all their needs are being met. So why would they need to look outside the system? Like, I think there's even like aspects of like curtains are closed in, mm-hmm. in, and in the train car, it is chosen to be dark in the party train car. Mm-hmm. Like there is this idea of being like, we don't need to look outside. It's fine. Mm-hmm. And it's because they don't need anything to change. It's those transient second class people, like the second class system that it's like, oh, I could improve with a life outside the system so i can look outside of it and i have the tools and ability to do because i am getting some of my needs met like there that's just an awesome again this train metaphor is fantastic (laughs) i love it trains are so cool you guys i love trains 
And um, and I think I think it's very fitting that when we get to the end of the movie, the proof that we see that life exists outside of the train is a polar bear. And I think that that's so fitting because what I remember in my first understanding of like climate change and global warming, and I think this is for probably for a lot of people that are that are my age. I don't know, probably if you're like super young, then you probably don't remember this is because global warming has always been a thing in your life. But for for me that like it uh, it really started being publicized when I was already like a teenager. One of the first images that really got popular and got this into the public consciousness was a poor polar bear that got stranded on an ice floe yes. and was just waiting to float back to land. Um, now, the polar bear was probably fine, okay, in reality, but the photo is so distressing. And that's the first time I can remember someone explaining to me and trying to help me conceptualize what climate change was, where we were going, mm -hmm. why we were going there, what we needed to do about it, you know, all of these things that are now a part of the public consciousness just in general because they're so ubiquitous and so off. Like everyone knows that the weather is different now than it was 10 years ago. Everyone knows that. But at the time that this polar yeah. bear image was published, we didn't know that. Okay, we didn't know that. Um, so I think it's very fitting that um, Bong Joon-ho chose a polar bear here. I don't know if this is why. I don't know if he just chose it because he needed a I snow mean, animal. But I, I think it's purposeful. I like to think it's purposeful because it, it really reminds me of that image. I also think that like there is something evocative about the fact that it's another predator. About the fact that it's like, okay, we've broken the system. But that doesn't mean it's not an easy win. Like the win was not breaking the system. Yeah. The win, The win is survival outside of it. And so, like, this concept of, okay, we're now being faced down with this predator. But it's also this predator that was near the end of extinction, much like humans were mm -hmm. in this story, that have now – that has now had a comeback. Yeah. I think that those – those that definitely plays into it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the polar so, bear can make it, that big animal that needs so much meat to survive, we can make it too. Yeah, which is, I mean, this polar bear does not look hungry. No, it looks like looks it like has been well good. fed. So it's like, oh, there's enough things out here that it's yeah. eaten you, well. You, and let me tell you, polar bears do not eat frozen food, which means no. it's not been eating frozen carcasses. It's been eating other things. Mm -hmm. That polar bear, that polar bear definitely had an entire tuna, a big one for breakfast, for yes. sure. Like he looks for like he eats good. Sure. So no, I think that, and I think that like this also, this concept of that the environment will correct itself is just, if we let it do its thing and stop mm -hmm. making it worse, it'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. All right. So, yeah. Here we come to the final question that we like to ask in all of our podcast media episodes. Did it resonate? So Landon, for you did Snowpiercer resonate in 2023? Jesus Christ did it. Uh, we are closer to this future than I feel like we are than we were when it came out. Um, <laughs> it's 10 years ago. I think that, yeah, no, we, this is, this is, uh, resonates from the capitalism to the classism to the way that the environment, even, the environmentalism speaks to it. I think that the art really makes it feel uh, continue to feel relevant in this time um, and will continue to feel relevant. Like, I think that this is a movie that can be watched 10 years from now and not, we won't be, like, cringing at how bad it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to know something funny, Landon? Right when I asked that, um, Twitch lost our connection. It's trying to reconnect now. But apparently we're not supposed to let the world know um about this but it's still recording so we're gonna finish the episode even though the stream is not live so i guess oh my god it's hilarious to... oh it just it just reconnected oh. so hopefully everyone can see again hello um... <laughs> so yeah uh, um... i'm so sorry the the nra does not want us to talk about it anymore we just got a uh <laughs> We just got it a disconnected. Notice. It's in the it's in the recording. I it's in the recording. I hope, but I know it didn't go out live to you, you guys. Um, but basically, Landon says yes. It resonated. Yes, it's <laughs> this is this is our future, and it resonates. And it's a movie that I will, uh, I'm sure, actually will continue to resonate. And it'll be one of those movies I think that will hit harder with time as we continue to ignore the uh, warnings 
that have been given. Yeah, it wasn't you, Luna. It was my whole stream. Like my whole stream. OBS just completely disconnected from Twitch. Just it even told me it, w- it, it it is like disconnected, resetting right when I asked Landon if it resonated. So I, I think that's. But anyway, I didn't answer yet. So I'll go ahead and answer. So did it resonate? Um, yes, like 100% Snowpiercer resonated with me the first time I saw it. It's resonated with me more and more every time I have seen it. I think this is one of those movies that, like we said at the beginning, you get more out of it every time you watch it because there's so much dense material here. And because it resonates so well, um, I enjoy all of the characters. I think they're all fantastically written and acted. And in addition to that, the themes, I think, just become more and more relevant as time marches on, as we march farther and farther into, um, you know, climate change and, and the effects of that. As we march, <laughs> Luna got the first again. Thank you, Luna. Um, as we march farther and farther into, uh, you know, this neo-capitalist hellscape that we are all in and seem to have no interest in getting out of. Um, so yeah, and I think this movie will continue to resonate and I will continue to recommend it to anybody that enjoys dystopia. If you are a lover of dystopia fiction, this movie is for you. I don't care what dystopias you typically like. This one is so good that I would recommend it to anyone that likes that sort of story, period, at the end. Love it. Yeah. No, Great. it's so good. Uh, if I any person that I'm just like, you aren't an amp- anti-capitalist yet. Are you sure? I'll show you a movie and make you one. And it's this <laughs> it's too real. It's too real. Like all you have it's to do. So like it has points. Yeah. And and I think that as we like get further in this time in this timeline, it it starts things start becoming clearer and clearer. In 2013, I think a lot of people could have been like, oh, it's just science fiction. It's fine. But now it's just like it's undeniable sure? at this point. And Wilford you is sure? and, you know, and Wilford is Elon Musk, you know, building his train for rich people. And you know, you can work on it too. If you buy a tick, you know, I mean it's yes, it resonates and it's yes. gonna continue to resonate more and more and more. Uh, so yeah. That was our Snowpiercer episode. I hope you guys like it. Hey, I hope you like I just want to say this, and we said it a little bit before stream started, but I was like, man, it's so nice to talk about uh, politics that don't make my head hurt and don't make me want to die a little inside because they're so poorly written. And I'm really excited that we got to do this stream today and we are starting out on a venture in which uh, we'll be able to talk about society as it is rather than the delusions of how someone wishes it was. Yeah, no more, no liberal fantasy for us this year. <laughs> no, it'll be only hard anti-capitalism from here on out. Oh, that's right. Thank you so much for the applause and thank you for the How Lunar. I am so glad Landon gets to live another week. Really appreciate that. Um, all right, you guys. So wrapping up here, um, where can you find us? So I know that this says how to a full boyfriend tomorrow, but it's a lie. So I'll explain what I was saying at the beginning of the stream today. We're, we're not going to play any Sims 2 after this today. And we're not going to stream tomorrow because um, I'm doing Super Bowl stuff. My parents actually came into town and are hanging out. And when we were first planning this, we thought like, it'll be no big deal. Go ahead and stream. But actually, it's really hard to, to commit to streaming when company's here. So <laughs> we're just doing the Snowpiercer episode. Um, and then I will see you guys next week. But next week will be Community Day, Stardew Valley for Saturday and Hatoful Boyfriend for Sunday. So because Uh, I'm not seeing you tomorrow, I want to just also say happy Valentine's Day. I love each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart, especially Landon. Landon, you're my number one stream love. (gasps) Everybody else, though, is number two collectively, all of you guys together. Mm -hmm. I love you all so much. Thank you so much for um, for hanging out with me uh, and talking about Snowpiercer. Couple of things. First of all, love you too. Second of all, uh, if you're like, what are we gonna do without Karen this afternoon and tomorrow? Uh, the Hatful boyfriends. I have been getting the notifications all week to go up, so maybe go rewatch those. The, they're now posted on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> second of all, Karen's been making TikToks recently, so you can go get her stuff on there. 
Yeah, I do have uh, a Miss Karen Terry on TikTok that I randomly post to. It's very, some random, very random. Some, <laughs> sometimes randomly post to. Um, and third of all, uh, if you're having Valentine's Day, uh, just know that you can buy yourself chocolate, you can buy yourself cupcakes, and you can buy yourself flowers, and it doesn't make it any less. Uh, and that it's a corporate holiday that feeds capitalism if you are not a if you are not a valentine's day person if you are celebrating with somebody uh whether it be yourself or a significant other then i hope you have a wonderful week that's true and you know what else you can do for valentine's day if you want you can get landon um a book off of her wish list for her classroom so you can do that as well from her social you and can <laughs> and if you would like to support our stream you can do so in all of the normal ways you can subscribe or do bits um, I also have a tip jar here on Twitch, and then we have a little merch store if you're interested in that. And I also have a throne wish list myself, if that's more your speed too. Uh, whatever, whatever way you like, whatever way you like. I'm, All right. I'm also going so, to say so, that there has been. I'm also going to say that there has been some posts on TikTok recently because of a super secret project that I might be working on. Uh, so you could go and like some of those posts and there will be some more and there might, there might be a, there might be something publishing worth coming out later this year. What? Karen doesn't so, know. This is Karen. Karen. Yeah, I really, right I now. legit don't know. I'm like not, I'm not <laughs> hamming it up. I don't know what the heck she's talking about, but Landon does already have a poetry book published. If you like poetry, you can get it. Um, it's linked actually down in my about in yeah. on my Twitch channel if you scroll down. And that was about like five years ago and mm -hmm. she's been writing a lot since then. So I'm so proud Just of saying. you. Oh my God. Just saying. That's so cool. That's so cool. Thanks. Ah! You know, I can only do, I was only doing five things. So I was like, why not do six? <laughs> only five. Only five. Why not six? <laughs> why okay. not? So, all right, you guys, we are going to, we're going to raid, um, we're going to raid into a friend um, that is playing Ocarina of Time right now. I know you guys have missed Majora's Mask. And um, so I'm just going to, we're going to give you a little bit of link, a little bit of link. Um, but before we do that, let's say goodbye to YouTube. So to those watching the VOD on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. Woo!